So welcome everybody and to today's episode where we want to talk about angular signals, which is currently, I think it's fair to say that it's the hottest topic in angular right now. I think um, it's all over Twitter. Everybody talks about signals. It's, it's the thing, the angular thing at the moment. Literally and the thing, yeah. Yeah, literally the thing. And yeah, we were thinking, how do we approach this episode? Because there's a lot to talk about. And we thought that we first start like, why do we even have signals? Like, why is it needed? Or why does the Angular team even think about it? Um, then we also want to briefly explain the API as far as it, we cannot show code, right? But we want to briefly explain the API so that you get an idea what it is about. And then also, why do we need it? And I think we have to talk a bit about change detection as well in this stream because, um, yeah, it's hard to talk about the benefits of signals without covering change detection. And then we also probably want to talk a bit, what does it mean for RxJS and maybe also some future things about signals. Right, and we could also go a little bit in direction of like, for example, integration with the NGRx because there also mm -hmm. have been new RFC with like a example implementation of the signal store, which also looks very interesting. And it's like, personally, I would love rather use it like that than like a plain signals the same way like rather use ngrx than plain rxjs so i think that's something we should also visit in today's yeah def definitely that's also something i recently tried on stream and i think that's a that's a very good point that we should that we should cover cool okay so yeah what um so Signals first occurred, I think we first hear, heard about them in a GD Summit, I think. You were there, Thomas, in Berlin, where um, the core team kind of presented the idea of having signals. And yeah, the whole idea basically comes from, I think it comes from also other frameworks because Svelte has signals, um, Quick has signals, uh, SolidJS is super reactive with signals. And I think Angular kind of picked up like um, the ideas there from having a signal. I think they also closed Berkeley with Ryan Carniato, I think is his name. It's the creator of SolidJS. And um, yeah, we now speak about reactivity. And when I first heard about that Angular wants to have reactivity, I thought, but we already have reactivity, right? Because we have RxJS. So why do we now need something else? because RxJS is actually reactive, but it's not a reactive primitive built into the framework. So it's like an additional library that also has reactivity. Yeah, that's a fair point, right? So even though like RxJS is always installed like in the Angular workspace because some of the APIs are RxJS based, it's nowhere near close to like all the APIs in Angular providing RxJS uh, like uh, properties as the streams and stuff like that. So that's a fair point to say that like, it was not like enough reactive out of the box when you just like created a new Angular project. Yeah, exactly. It seems like it was not in the first part of the framework. It was more like an afterthought to bring in RxJS and the reactive things. And now they are thinking about having like a primitive type, uh, that a reactive primitive basically, which they call signal. And yeah, let's maybe first um, talk about how the API of a signal looks like. So let's say you would have a component and on this component, you have a public property, for example, foo, which has a value of five. So that's how you would declare the property. Now with a signal, what you can do is you can say foo equals signal five and you pass in five as the initial value. So that's something important. The signal always has a initial value. It's kind of like a behavior subject, kind of from the fundamental model. Um, and then what signal gives you is a bunch of things. So you can call a signal, which is basically like a getter internally. And that gives you the value of the signal, but you also have a couple of methods. So you have a set method, which allows you to change the value of the signal. Then you have a update method, that allows you to basically take the value of the signal and kind of compute a new value and set mm -hmm. that as the new value. And you have a mutate method, which allows you to mutate a signal. So that's usually used when 
your signal value is a reference, uh, like an object or an array, for example. And that kind of way you can do, you can use signal. So that's the basic API. So that means you can choose if you want to use like a mutable or immutable approach to your updates. Yeah, exactly. So immutable approach would be with the update function and the muted function for the, for the mutable approach. So that means in update, you are supposed to always like return like the same type of the signal. So if it was like a type user, when I call the update, I have to like recreate like or create a new user object and return it back with some change property in it. Is that correct? Yeah, I would like the signal accepts a generic. If you of course say like it's a user or a string, for example, then you can also return a string. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's type safe. So in practice, it would probably be said like as a generic of like a single yeah. type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And there are two other cool things about signals. Um, we have also computed signals. So we often see these examples with a count, uh, which is a signal and then a double count. And the double count basically is a computed signal. So Angular provides a computed function, which accepts a callback and this callback is an every time executed when you, um, so in the callback you use the signal and this callback is always executed when the signal changes basically. Mm -hmm. So it reacts on changes of the signals that are used inside the callback. Okay, and so then, it's reactive, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And so they have another, sorry, yeah. Please, please, please finish. Yeah, and they have another function which is called effect which allows you to run side effects when a signal changes. Mm -hmm. But you see like we have quite some large API. So we already mentioned like we can like uh, get the value of the signals Then we have a set, update, mutate. Mm -hmm. And that's just like on a signal itself. And now we started like going into other things like when we are using computed and effect. But I would say before we like explore like the whole universe, let's just go like really in depth yeah. on the signal itself. And then we can like also get deeper on those other APIs because mm -hmm. like just provide like uh, like also like a deeper view of those things. So we build like a good foundation and then we can move on to other APIs. So let's say we have a signal and I have some value. And as we discussed that most likely I want to type it like with the generic type is this way mm -hmm. the generics, right? So let's say I have a signal which is of type like user array or something like that. So user list. And now, like I have these three different methods to basically change the value of the signal if I understand correctly, right? So yeah, I have a yeah. set, I have a update, and I have a mutate. So how mm -hmm. would I know like which of those methods I want to use in my component when if I had like a new form where I define this new user and when I submit the form, I want to add it to the list of those users. So probably maybe behind the scenes, I do a backend request and once the update is finished, but let's just forget about that. And I want to add this new user into that list of users, which I already have stored as a signal. So what are there the options and what are the trade-offs? Which of those methods will I use? And if I use those, yeah, what kind of trade-offs will I will be getting? Mm -hmm. So I think the set one is, set is actually only used for like simple things. So you could also use, um, let's say for example, you have a counter and you want to increment that counter, then mm -hmm. set is not the best option because you need to get the, a hold of the current counter signal value. Mm -hmm. So in that case, set would be the much better, um, update would be the much better option because you get the current value of the signal. So if you just want to set it to something new, then use set. But if you want to really update or basically do some change the signal based on the current signal value, then yeah, you should use update. And the mutate is basically then to mutate references, right? Okay. So that means like for me, the first big distinction is uh, in the setter, I just really don't get any kind of context. So if I wanted the previous value, I would have to get it explicitly. In the yeah. update, I'm already getting that current value and same in the mutate, correct? Yeah. Okay, exactly. so so that means also for this example I mentioned previously with like the list of users, then if I just wanted to add it, if I use the mutate, I get the current list and I can just push the value mm -hmm. in the list, I guess. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. And if I wanted to use the update, 
then I would probably recreate, uh, well, create a new array where I would spread the array of those mm -hmm. existing users, like with three dots, right? spread operator. And then like the last item of that new array I would be creating in that update method would be that new user. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's that's right. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So what would be then like the implications? Like why would I choose like the mutate versus the update? Like let's uh, let's look into that. Like what could be like some implication of using one or the other method? Um, I think it kind of boils down a bit to, to the same question. Do you want to, like, even if you have a array without a signal and you just, would you recreate your array or would you just push a value into it? Okay. Like, I, so, I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a difference internally. Yeah. So if, if you look at it from this perspective, then that I would be thinking that like, if let's say just without the signal, if I store this array in like a component property, I personally mm -hmm. am more in favor of like this immutable approach because then I know that if I would use that property, which stores this user array and pass it to like some child component through inputs, then even if that child component would be on push, I would be, I would know that it's going to work. So mm -hmm. I guess this would stay exactly the same also with the signals, at least currently, right? That it's safer mm -hmm. to use the immutable approach because we might be using that signal value in the, as an as a, as a input for another component, like in the property binding, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that brings us to, to something very interesting about um, signals and how they affect change detection, right? Because um, that's actually one of the big ideas behind the, having this reactive primitive um, to have better change detection. And maybe we should quickly explain how change detection works today in Angular mm -hmm. and how signals will maybe improve it. So... Um, you want to take a shot at this? Yeah, that's not like the easiest thing I feel <laughs> like, like in depth, but like the, I will try. So basically like yeah. graph, graph picture, right? So uh, most of applications today in existence built with Angular are still using ZoneJS, right? And ZoneJS is this library which uh, basically patches all the native browser APIs, like uh, even listeners for clicks and other events, or like when the... Uh, response comes from the HTTP call and stuff like that. So that way, uh, Angular will be notified that some of those things are happening. So basically, the Angular uses that zone and the zone, there is some kind of integration, which I'm not completely aware from which side. But at the end of the day, basically, whenever, if, whenever any of those events happens in the browser, uh, Angular will trigger change detection at the application root, it will do like this new application tick or something like that. I, not mm -hmm. completely clean, clear on the exact API, but there is like a top level tick. And then based on what, um, and this will start like this change detection kind of on the Angular application. And then uh, based on like how those components are set up, what kind of change detection mechanism they have, if it's the default one or on push, and based on that, if they are dirty or not, Angular will know to re-render and re-execute these components, which should be affected. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, like exactly. So, so there very is some version, very, very rapid. Yeah, version. yeah, exactly. So SoundJS is basically just monkey patches the async API, everything that happens, like the scroll events, the click handlers, and just notifies Angular, hey, you need to run change detection. But Angular doesn't know what changed, and then they do, as Thomas explained, the dirty checking where they go through the component tree and then they check if what changed and what is dirty. And um, so the thing here is that this is probably not the most efficient way of running change detection because it needs a lot of checks. And that's also why we got on push initially. Because with on push, you can say, hey, please check this part of the tree only if inputs change, if it's marked, um, marked for check, so basically marked dirty. And that's basically happening when an observable is subscribed with the async pipe because the async pipe under the hood marks it marks the component for check, 
or if a click occurred on one of its children or on the component itself. But onPush is basically a way to optimize the change detection, the run, the amount of checks Angular has to do, because you only check the inputs, and if nothing changed, you don't check that part of the tree actually. Yeah, and also that like even more that that input like the the reference has to change, so it will not change. Yeah, like, yeah. like exactly. at the deep equals, but only like the if the reference is still the same, and that's why only way to trigger it is to recreate the stuff like objects and arrays, and that's why we even do this immutable approach to updates. Mm -hmm. And now the hope is that with signals we know Angular basically could know where the change happened. So currently you need to go from the top and you need to check everything. And with signals, the idea is that you know where the change happened and therefore you can run change detection at the specific component actually. This is currently not yet, um, not yet implemented. Maybe also some notes for people who have never worked with signals. So the whole si that's something important to realize what is the current state of signals. So currently, the Angular team made a, um, R there's still an open RFC where people can discuss about signals and can, yeah, can basically join the discussion and already play around with, with the API. But so the Angular team has now in Angular 16, which is not released yet, so, but you can go ahead and install it by um, npm install Angular at next. With at next, you get the next version of Angular, which is 16. And there they already have a prototype of signals. So that's still a prototype. And I think even in 16, it will only be development preview. It will not be final yet. But I think this pr approach is pretty, pretty cool because you can already play around. They still have the RFC open. It's easier to discuss on an RFC if you have hands-on experience with the things, you can try it out. So that's the current state of, of signals. So currently in version 16 or in the next release, you get the signals um, as primitives, and that's basically it as far as I know. I don't know if they already merged some helpers for Rx interpolation, but probably not. That I don't know. But uh, so like just to connect it to that previous thing. So basically, we spoke about the change detection, and this is just a preview. And the, the outcome of that is that uh, even if the signals are there, that kind of uh, deeper integration with the Angular itself, with regards to change detection, is not currently in those PR from what I understand. Is that correct? Yeah. Right? So so basically, first they only add the signals. And then once the API gets stable and people start to use it, probably only then they will start to explore how they could adjust the code in the Angular core, which would allow to triggering of this new, more fine-grained change detection yeah because currently if you use a signal inside a template everything works like the template gets updated but that only happens if you click somewhere like if you click a button then basically change detection runs and the, so the signal standard gets standard standard exactly change detection but so if you would up yeah if you update a signal from somewhere else that basically sonchaos doesn't know about then it doesn't work then of course it doesn't get updated Okay, so that's also maybe something which is good to know for the folks who are like playing around with that. So basically, yeah. today signals, even though they are available, uh, it's still working with the old school or current change detection. So that means all those rules which we learn uh, over the years on how to trigger it and how to work with it, if it doesn't work and stuff like that, they still do apply. We still have to have some kind of event. We still have to trigger zone. The application is not zoneless yet. And mm -hmm. uh, only those components which are change detected, change detected through like the standard mechanism through the zone will then call the signal in their template and get the new value. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. that's a, so it's not enough that the signal value has changed. Mm -hmm. it, it is necessary that there is still like this original change detection mechanism running. And maybe yeah, exactly. in the future, this is going to change, but we do not know that yet, but we hope that this is going to be the case. So mm -hmm. if we try to like make this work, so that maybe can also bring us back to those other APIs which we missed. So maybe it's time now to speak about the use effect, mm -hmm. I think. 
and then we could try to like kind of force it to make it work today like how it would how we could get there even though like you shouldn't really do that but we can probably also learn a thing or two about how this works by creating that example yeah so you mean how to do it without change detection or like without relying on zone so exactly so how to do it in today's world where angular still kind of depends on zone and there is not yet like a native integration with the signals mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. we can probably have like a workaround for that with the current api with this user effect so we can try that but first let's let's speak about like this user effect how it works and then we can try to tie these things together yeah so use effect is actually pretty similar to a computed signal so we already talked about computed signal so if you use this, the computed signal accepts a callback and then uh, inside this callback you can use signals to recompute a value and whenever the re the used signal in the callback changes your signal will be recomputed but the difference is the computed signal returns a new signal actually and the effect just runs side effects so you can basically if you are familiar with NGRX, it's like, or with RxJS, it's basically like a tap that happens when a signal changes from the mental model. Um, that's more or less the idea. And what you could do, of course, what you could do to make it work without zone is basically um, in an effect kind of triggers zone yourself or, or the, the change detection yourself. But let's That's... say even in that example, which we still have zone, but what you said is that like, even in today's application, if we mm -hmm. got a signal in a template and then we change it somewhere else in a way which didn't trigger zone for some reason, right? Yeah. That, yeah. Point, that it would not basically trigger the, the change detection in that component, which is correct. But then probably what we could do is to exactly like inject the change detection ref, like the mm -hmm. change detection change detector ref and yeah. in that use effect right we could like force this we could mark like for for check but that would not be enough because it's kind of like the same thing like with the async pipe i guess so we would yeah. have to call like actually the detect changes yeah i tried to make it um i haven't finished it yet but i also tried to make a pipe where you could change it basically in your sig in your template you could use like ng4 let value of signal but you don't call it, you just pass it to a pipe and the pipe then calls it because the call is basically like observable subscribe. Mm -hmm. And that would work. But then also then you, again, it's basically pretty similar to the async pipe that we have today. Mm -hmm. And in the future, this is something that is really cool that I really liked about signals is you don't have to use any kind of pipe. You just go like, let's say you have a signal which emits an array of users. Mm -hmm. Then you would do ng4 let user of and then you call your signal and you don't have to use any pipe. That's pretty cool. I see. Okay. So like just to summarize, basically the future most likely is going to be bright, but it will take a while to get there. And currently if we use the signals, we have to use mm -hmm. them like in that landscape of Angular with standard stuff, which we all know and work with for some years now already. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And one of the interesting questions is also now we get signals and but as we said at the beginning uh, we already have we already have um, RxJS which does something similar which is also reactive right and the signal is pretty similar to behavior subject so many people are concerned like what will happen to RxJS will it replace will signals replace RxJS or how how does it look in the future I see, yeah. Well, yeah, I've seen uh, quite some people like uh, tweeting about that, that like, okay, now uh, as we get the signals, we don't really need RxJS, like people never really liked it and stuff like that. And like, I have to say, like, I understand because RxJS, of course, is like one of the more controversial parts of the Angular. And I can also like speak like from my own experience that like, at least initially I was really having a bit hard time to mm -hmm. wrap my head around like the observable streams and like how to work with them and it took a while even though it was like back in 2000 whatever it was like 16 when the angular 2 was first coming out but of course once you build like all these mental models now i would not really want to work without it and i think 
there are like some use cases which will always be better handled with that, but maybe not all of the use cases. So there will be probably some space to have like signals only applications if they're like really simple, but probably for any kind of like more complex or serious development, you would still probably want to use also RxJS, right? Yeah, definitely. Because like not everything, I think RxJS makes a lot of sense where it makes sense or how to say it. Uh, because I've seen a lot of applications where they, where people just went with everything has to be a stream and not everything has to be a stream. That kind of overcomplicates the logic and um, yeah, makes code, from my opinion, hard to maintain. Um, but there are cases where you really need RxJS. So a classic example would be like a user search. Let's say you want to search for GitHub users on a backend. So you type to an input field and then you want to fire off a request and you want to search for users on the backend. So this is a perfect scenario for RxJS and it will be for the future as well. Because you would type and then you want to run a bunch of things. You want to debounce, so you don't want to fire a request on each keystroke. You only want to fire if the search query changed. So if I type Thomas R K and then I remove R and K, but I already have you in the list, I don't want to refire another request. Then also, you want to cancel outgoing requests so that you don't have like timing issues when if one request takes longer than the next one, the new one that's coming in, then suddenly you could display the wrong data. And all these kind of things is so easily done because it's a debounce time, distinct until change, and the switch map in RxJS. And probably you also want to load, uh, show a spinner, which can easily be done with tap. And those kind of things you cannot really do with signals, right? Yeah, I think that's correct. And... I mean, people maybe would argue like, yeah, but that's like the only example, like the standard example when you like do multiple requests uh, to backend and you want to time it. But I would say in practice, like in real life development, it's not just that you will probably also want to like buffer some kind of request yeah. that they come together, right? So if you go to a page and then you need to translate some special business code and as the components keep being loaded, you can open some kind of like a buffer for a time window where you collect all of those and then mm -hmm. kind of like batch it, right? So, and those things are much easier to do with RxJS and they tend to improve like user experience dramatically, at least in those cases, which really need them. And I would even say you can generalize it even further, which is uh, it's always like the use of RxJS is always about the situations where you want to handle multiple calls together. So what do I mean by that? Like, let's say this original example from Kevin, where you have this type of head search, right? And you do first search, second search, third search, right? But you want to cancel them. You want to make sure they are in order. You want to debounce them. That's also this kind of like multiple calls, like basic, like a change call on the input. Like if I type as I type, I have multiple change calls, right? So, and uh, whenever you want to handle them together, that means like, yeah, debounce, throttle, cancel previous, only get the latest response or buffer or whatever have you, you cannot really do that like with plain functions, or with signals mm -hmm. for that matter, right? You have to have some kind of system around that, which allows you, which will, uh, which allows you to handle them together to do all these kind of things. So without like signals, you could get this, oh, sorry, sorry, without the RxJS, you could get this kind of functionality, but it would involve writing a lot of logic, which is usually not ideal and very error prone and hard to maintain. And that's why most likely, RxJS will stay as a part of the stack because those use cases are pretty important in many applications. They do lead to much better user experience and they are very hard and error prone to solve other way. Plus RxJS is baked into a lot of APIs from Angular, right? The HTTP client returns an observable. They are always backwards compatible. Plus I personally see the future Signals plus Angular. It's not Signals or Angular. I see it's Signals and Angular. Uh, and signals Angular. and RxJS. And RxJS, yeah. Right, right, right. 100%, 100%. Uh, and this kind of can brings us back to that RFC where there was already like a pull request which showcased the interop functionality, mm -hmm. which was like from observable, where you basically 
convert an observable to a signal which subscribes behind the scenes and also unsubscribes once not no longer necessary which is amazing and then of course also the other way around where you can basically get an observable stream from the signal so there was this cool example i think in manfred's blog or somewhere uh where it started basically exactly with the signal which reacted to the changes of the input for let's say like a search field so and then that's a signal but then you streamify it so you can debounce mm -hmm. it and get um, and get uh, the switch map only the latest response but then instead of subscribing either explicitly or using async pipe what you can do is to basically wrap that stream again like uh, from observable to get a signal and then just use signal in a template as if nothing happened and yeah. this is pretty cool and especially uh, if you think about it from that point of view what we discussed previously that probably in the future the change detection will be improved by the use of signals so then you have this all exist old existing code where you have a lot of streams and then you just sprinkle a little bit of signals on top of that and suddenly you can convert your application to zoneless and get much better performance right so that's something which will be most likely realistic yeah and i think the example that you mentioned i think there could be like even a step it's already pretty cool right you have a stream you or you have a signal you convert it to a stream and then back to a signal and then you can use it in the template but i think we can even go i hope we can even go one step further and i'm not sure if this is coming but it would be cool to get signal inputs basically so that oh yeah this is also in the in the one of those prs i think already so that would ah, even okay sorry right. even more we have a cool comment which is related to what we are currently discussing from the leo so yeah but more signals and less RxJs. i think like 80 percent of my daily code is covered with signals so when i see something like this what comes to my mind is exactly that example which kevin spoke about previously that many angular applications currently like overuse rxjs for the things which could have been sync or solve with like uh, ng on changes lifecycle hook for example so and of course if the starting point is an application which uses rxjs in places where it wouldn't have been necessary then of course if you get signals then you see, say like okay i now could convert all this logic just to be signal based and you are most likely 100 percent correct because of course if it didn't need to be rxjs in the first place then it's a natural like perfect target for converting to signal or even to convert to like a very basic plain logic which reacts to something like uh engine on changes lifecycle hook right so that could be this kind of like underlying problem then again i of course i don't know your application so that's just like my guess yeah so um we have another question oh oh my mouse is out of battery so thomas you probably right right you I'm are now the master of the moderator. show like, <laughs> yeah so another one from mlz 11 is could you give an example of use case where people often overuse rxjs well i can and probably kevin can too so let me start so what i've seen quite often in like the while in the projects where i've been like consulting is that people have some kind of like view component which needs to react to changes of the inputs for example so one specific example which i really remember very well was a component which was used underneath the input or text area where it would react to amount of characters in that input or a text area and it would have like the maximum count of the characters which is supported and then it would say like 25 of 280 characters or something like that right similar to like on twitter and uh, such a component could be written very sim like simply with like a plain angular so we would have like let's say two inputs we would have an input like current character count and we have an input of the total character count and then because those are like primitive numbers so you can even use like on push it's not going to be a problem and then in the template you would just display them and then the logic was that the derived state was like how many characters 
you can still type so kind of like a total minus current so how many characters you have left and another logic was that if you were like approaching that limit that if it was closer than 20 percent to that limit then it would turn like orange and then if it would be over the limit it would turn red so we have like some base state and then we had some like derived state and of course uh with the plain angular you can just do something like ng on changes where you would uh, whenever those input changes you can evaluate if those limits were met and then you can store that state in some other component properties like is warning is error something like that right and also you can calculate like characters left and this can be just basic on changes and you can just bind these properties in your template or you can even do it in theory in line in the template where you say like total minus current is what you have left. And then you can like do some basic math to like trigger those CSS classes, right? But of course, what people sometimes do is like that they streamify those inputs with the behavior subjects and the setters. And then they create, uh, and then they create uh, derived streams where they combine latest of those two numbers and then they map it to a CSS class. And of course, this is going to work, but it's unnecessary, right? So that would be like a great example of a logic where ArcGIS was not necessary and it could have been done with plain Angular. And of course, it can be also done very nicely with signals, like in the future. So I think that, I hope that answers your question. And so whenever you have a component which doesn't really do anything async, but still uses ArcGIS, that's like, from my point of view, like a bit of a misuse. Yeah. And I think if you overstream, at least from my point of view, it also often makes it harder to test, um, which is, is also another downside and to debug. Um, but but we are all for um, RxJS, like use it where it makes sense, but use it where it makes sense, right? and not like just use it everywhere and don't think about it. Because theoretically you can also, uh, if you want to sum two numbers, you can also do that with streams, theoretically. You can create two, but should you? Probably not. Exactly. So this brings us back to that interop and coexistence of the signals and the RxJS mm -hmm. streams. So basically you kind of want both and they should handle the part which they are best at. So. Whenever you have something asynchronous and whenever you want to, to handle multiple of those executions together for those reasons of cancellation, make sure that there is no race condition, that they happen uh, one after the other or in parallel, but like organized, or you want to like buffer them or whatever have you, then most likely you want uh, RHS. And for everything else, if you just want some kind of like sync derived state, then probably signals will represent a nicer API compared to like using something like a lifecycle hook. Now that we that you say this and that we talk about, so something comes to mind. I don't know if this, it's not thought through. It's just like comes right, to mind. Right, let's explore, of course. Maybe in the future we could say use signals for sync stuff and RxJS for async stuff. Sure. Maybe. I haven't thought it through, uh, but that's kind of, maybe that's a good idea to think about it. Mm, yeah, I think like, yeah, that would most likely make sense. And if you think about like, let's say you have some kind of like form, right? And mm -hmm. then you could say like, but my React, it's a reactive form. So it has streams. So it's async like, well, I mean, like as a user types, like that's kind of like async as those keystrokes are hitting the keyboard, yeah. but not necessarily because like what should then, it's, it's about what should happen in that logic if that's sync or async, right? It's not like, of course, everything mm -hmm. in browser is like async, like if you scroll or if you click, like you click at some point of time, but then the logic which should happen as a reaction to that kind of event, like what user did, the user interaction, if that logic is synchronous or asynchronous, right? So if mm -hmm. we go back to that form example and we have already all the data in our component and we want to like, sub filter uh, another drop down based on like the value of the first drop down or something like this but well, that's still synchronous so it could be just purely signal based so if i'm changing value of one i can create the derived state of the another one with something like computed now again if we added like a backend to the mix and we would have to make a request to get the options for that second drop down then most likely we would start with signal 
then convert to a stream and then back to a signal to use those values in the drop down. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But yeah, I think I, I like that what you just said. 100% you could have this like a very general rule. If the mm -hmm. logic, which is triggered based on user interaction, is synchronous, can be pure signals. But if it's asynchronous, most likely it would benefit from being able to use those RxJS things. Now, yeah. maybe a contra example to that is when we do like uh, not the reads, but uh, creates and updates and deletes in a backend. Of mm -hmm. course, this is asynchronous, but uh, often happens like just like one off. Like we will probably not be like as we type like creating fifty things in a backend. So there you could yeah. also say that probably it's more like if it's asynchronous and can happen more than once in like a short period of time, then probably you want RxJS. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. That... I would say that that can be yeah. cool. Then again, uh, I personally am not really looking forward to use like plain signals in my logic the same way I am not really using plain RxJS in my logic nowadays mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because uh, of course depends on like the size of the application and the use case but whenever I'm working on some serious project in like a serious environment I like to have a lot of structure and repeated like patterns which I can use to solve all the requirements so therefore I am um, grabbing for or like search, uh, reaching for something like NGRX which basically tames those RxJS streams for me to a form which is much easier to handle than like plain old RxJS streams, right? So I hope that this is going to be very similar with the signals. What do you think? Yeah, because initially um, when signals came out and if you look at the signals API, they have like set, they have getters, they have effects, they have computed. This all kind of sounds like that they will bring everything that NGRX does, right? You have a yeah. computed value, you have effects and all these things. So but what is missing is like the structure. Exactly. The structure mm -hmm. is completely missing. So I last time went on a stream and tried to make an NGRX signal only version. Okay. And I had a pretty hard time. So, so because... try to like rebuild like the NGRX APIs with signals from scratch. Yes. Oh, so wow. I basic, okay. I basically did. I tried to follow the same structure because I like that you have side effects, that you have selectors, that you have like your core state, which was a signal, then computed state. That was painful. Yeah. You. S <laughs> yeah. Okay. So people watch me there. <laughs> um, yeah. So I basically tried to recreate this, and. I was like maybe 15 minutes in and I already missed NGRX because it gives you like the structure. Also, um, you have some pretty nice things. For example, you want to load a list of to-dos. You have this init actions which fire off the effect initially and all these kind of things. Um, I felt a bit like I was creating my own NGRX kind of, which looks a bit different. And then if somebody comes to the team, they look at this and it looks different in this team and in that team. and it's, it's right. unstructured, so. So this yeah. is a very good point, right? So like it will be possible to use it like low level and many people will use it low level, but then what always happens is that like every feature is done slightly differently and also that most people will most likely end up recreating those well-known patterns, which we use since some years, like select some state, update the state, perform some, some kind of side effects, right? And then because that structure works so well, then probably it will be prepackaged for us again with the signals. Yeah. And hopefully, even like with the RxJS integration, I think I saw something like this already in that RFC for the NGRX signal store, which would basically take away all this decision load and like pressure to always decide how to do it, how to structure it, how to name things, mm -hmm. where to put those things and uh, just follow those rules which follow the best practices already, right? So that is exactly the reason why I think it will not be much about using low-level signals, but more like about using these uh, well-known structured APIs, which will be now signal-based. 
Which brings us to that RFC from Marko Stanimirovic on the NGRX uh, slash platform repository on the GitHub from mm-hmm. two weeks ago, which is basically similar to like Angular RFC. This is RFC for the NGRX, where he shows implementation of the NGRX signal, signal store and signal state. And I mean, I had a quick look on it and from like... Like the API looks pretty cool, like it's kind of composable, like with the functions. So like it's similar to what Angular did with like the uh, standalone APIs when you like define the router and then like with the uh, router config and with like this and with that. So now you have something like a create signal store with state, with computed, with updaters, with effects, with hooks. So all the well-known things from the NGRX, but now signal based and with this nice composable API, which most likely will also be then tree shakeable. But what I wanted to highlight is that there is a showcase of a very cool integration with the RxJS, which is only available, as far as I understand, inside of those new signal-based effects. So there is this uh, function called like with effects, when you want to add the effects to that particular NGRX state slice or or store and then basically what you can do is uh, you can use this new provided function called like rx effect and then use inside of it the um, standard like rxjs operators uh, inside of the pipe operator and then you kind of store it in a property and just return back and most likely this is going to be then integrated within that NGRX signal store so that whenever this emits, it calls the appropriate signals and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So this looked very cool because it's exactly what we were speaking about previously, where you want to have this cool, seamless integration of the signals and RxJS for the parts they are best at. And it looks like this is already part of this initial RFC, which gives me like a lot of hope and like looking forward to that. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. So the brand was saying link, please. So let me quickly pass the link into the chat and also probably show it for the folks who will be watching this on YouTube. Let's just quickly show it on the screen. And for the folks who will be just listening to this, then you can just go to GitHub NGRX slash platform and then check into like the issues and there you should see the RFC for the... NGRX signal store where the Marco goes really in depth on all the new APIs with also the examples of how to use it, how to solve some typical use cases. And there is also already quite some comments from the people about those APIs. So I'm really looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I think we covered most of the topics. Let's quickly also go through the questions because I think we yeah. missed a couple of those. Um, maybe I had their some... one favorite, which was this. Hi, don't you know how exactly Effect understands that some signal inside callback has been changed and therefore the Effect needs to re-execute? I really like this question because it allows us to showcase a little bit of like the how the signals are implemented behind the scenes so first maybe kevin you can like give a quick recap on the effect like write some effect here with the words and then we can look like (laughs) deeper into how how this is actually done Mm -hmm. behind the scenes because that's something which i was looking into like when first studying this rfc from the angular team Yeah. So yeah, I tried to explain effect again. So basically effect is a function that is provided by Angular. You import effect and then you call effect and you pass in a callback. So let's say we would have a counter signal and you want to lock a additional message whenever this counter changes. So then you would pass in the callback to the effect and inside there you would do console lock counter changed this dot counter. And then Basically, Angular knows um, that this dot counter changed, and therefore reruns the effect. And now and we Thomas will to, explain how this works. Yeah, now, now we have to check like why it knows. <laughs> so I also don't remember completely exactly how those things were called in the code, but like the rough picture is that like whenever you create signals, 
and you call signals in some place, there is some kind of data structure behind the scenes, which uh, basically stores those references and creates like a two-way graph. So, so signals which use other signals, they know about each other because whenever you call signal somewhere, it will add like this connection in the data structure which follows that it's like from one node to another. And if you want to see it like in detail, you can check that RFC, but basically that's kind of the idea of that. And that also then led to like some discussions of the members of the Angular team where they were like speaking about two different things. So we have then with the signals, because there is this graph data structure behind the scenes, we have this reactivity graph of how the values need to update whenever some other value changes, which now will be not matching the graph of the components in the browser, or like with the tree, which is a specific type of graph, as they go from root to all the child components to all the leaf components, right? So, so th those are like these data structures. It's, it's a graph. It's like the connections between each other. And to get back to that question, whenever you call signals, Whenever you call a signal, so when you do like this kind of getter, the 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 edge is added to that graph from that signal, which is like the the uh, how was it provider or creator or producer to uh, like a place which is the consumer, and that's how they know because there are explicit references being stored, and that will be also probably something which will then allow them to do this new kind of change detection in the future without the zone where they would just react to those changes in that reactivity graph. All right. Do we have something else? Uh, da, da, da. So we have here uh -huh. uh, Mihai. Just wow, this is like a rocket, a rocket science to me at the moment. Just started learning JavaScript a bit late to programming party, but people say it can be done. Well, it definitely can be done. And this is also maybe like a cool thing to point out that for the people who are just uh, starting to learn programming, I think the signals will represent a simpler path compared to like RxJS. So, so there's definitely something which uh, like was the goal or one of the goals of the Angular team were introducing these new signal-based APIs to make the learning curve not as steep as it was previously, mm -hmm. which is also in line with introducing standalone components so that the setup is simpler. So uh, this means that now is really much better time of getting into like Angular front-end development than it ever was. So hopefully yeah. it will prove correct. Plus standalone components. Also, Mihai, um, just if you are new to programming, just keep keep on learning, building. Just have fun with it. It's something I just want to say um, for everybody that is coming new. Just have fun with programming. Don't be like, if something doesn't work, don't give up. Just, just have fun with it. Really enjoy the learning experience and the path to get to your goal. I think that's pretty cool. And it's never too late to start learning, right? Hundred um, percent. I also and... entered programming pretty late, and it's all about having fun. I think that's the most important thing. Just keep building stuff, try out new things. I think that's important. Hundred percent, and also maybe these things which we discussed today, like were a bit more like in depth, mm -hmm. and uh, that doesn't mean you like need to know this when to be like effective with Angular to actually create applications. Uh, that deliver actual value to your users, right? So this is more like for people who want to, who are interested in these new things and more like in-depth view of how this works or what this means or where it can go in the future. But that doesn't mean you need to be fully well-versed in those things to be able to write cool applications. So just start small. And then whenever you feel like you encounter like a situation where you would prefer like some more structure so then you can reach for that next thing which allows you to develop even more but it's like a natural growth then um brandon my mouse unfortunately died and my laptop is closed so i cannot really 
I cannot really send you the link, but it's basically, um, you can find the stream on my Twitch channel. It's under one of the latest recording. I think the, the name of the stream is called Fun Day with Signals or something. It was recorded last Sunday. Um, yeah. And we can definitely provide them the link in the description. Yeah, definitely. On all the platforms. So that's yeah. something which we should do. All right. So do we have something else? I like the comment there. Maybe we can show that with the signals. That's a yeah. good comment to close it. This one. <laughs> <laughs> Even this one. Yeah, so for everybody listening, we see like a lot of traffic signs. Um, yeah, that seems emojis. to be like the go to emoji. There was like a bit of a fight between like if it's like the satellite, like for this kind of signal, but I think that the traffic ah. lights emoji, then it's like a definite winner in the, mm -hmm. and everybody now just uses the traffic light whenever they write anything about the signals on the social media yeah that's one for sure but yeah cool so yeah it's it's a huge topic it's a new topic definitely i cannot say like i fully wrapped my head around it i hope that uh, we will get some like pre-packaged apis as it seems to be like to use in our application so we don't have to figure out everything by ourselves and that would make the whole uh, thing like much simpler in the end, like to embrace it and get all the benefits while minimizing the costs. Yeah. Um, also, if you prefer, if, if you later want to uh, listen again to this episode, because we talked about quite some stuff, like feel free, we will re release um, that video also on my YouTube channel. Feel free to visit it there. And we also have, we are now also on Spotify, where you can also find um, our podcast. So if Angular you prefer to, podcast, yeah. Exactly. If you prefer to listen while you are in a car or somewhere like in a train, then um, yeah, go to Spotify, search for Angular Experts Podcast. Um, Definitely. Yeah. And it's also on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. So whichever platform you like, you can find it there. Hmm. Cool. So cool. yeah, I guess it's time to wrap it up for today. Uh, hope you enjoyed the episode. Hope you learned something. Hope you had the patience with us when we also tried to make sense of all these new things because yeah, it's still like a work in progress and learning for all of us. And uh, I guess uh, see you next time. Mm -hmm. Thanks everybody for joining. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.